In this video, we do an in-depth breakdown of Iconic, which helps you manage and share all of your media. All right, real quick, you're watching Video Brand. Special thanks to our sponsors for making this NAB coverage possible. Massive, Metricool, Adspective, Vestigit, and OpenReel. All right, back to the video. All right, what's up, everyone? I'm here with Ian from Iconic, and uh, we're gonna talk about media management and Iconic. Uh, and I'm actually a big fan of Iconic. We use it to manage our media, so uh, a bit familiar with it, but I would love to get an overview uh, for people that uh, are not familiar with Iconic. Yeah, for sure. So tell me a bit about where your content lives today and how you intend to manage it and where your editors are. Yeah, for sure. So we've got a uh, remote team of editors. Um, we recently got, before everything, was sort of either some version of like cloud or kind of moving stuff around, but then we wanted to centralize everything, so we got a Synology NAS. Um, that's connected online, and then that's connected to a uh, computer, which now uses the ISG uh, which actually, remind me what that stands for? It's and, the Iconic Storage Gateway. There we go. I can, so the app that basically says, okay, this drive is going to be recognized on the cloud for Iconic. Um, so it's sort of mapped, the whole drive is mapped out. And then we sync some of the files with Backblaze or Google Cloud Storage um, so that, because the editors can't directly download the files off the NAS, they have to, the files have to go up to the cloud, right. some sort of storage, and then they're able to access it. Um, and so we're using everything to use it as a central spot where they can sort and organize. We can find all the raw footage if someone needs to search something or try to find something from the past, they have access to it. Um, and then we use it a lot for edit reviews and uploading cuts and leaving feedback and notes and then handling the, the final files. So that's sort of our workflow. And tell me what kind of formats do you work with that you'd be attempting to ingest into Iconic? Oh, like file formats yeah. and stuff. Um, it's either going to be like ProRes files, MP4s. Cool. So in your case, what you would be doing is using an iconic storage gateway to scan your on-premise content. Uh, essentially, the ISG is something that you would point to a destination. It's uh, storage agnostic, and you can install it on Windows, Linux, and Mac. You would install that, point it to a location where all of your content would live, and you'd be adding your content. And the ISG essentially scans that content, it can map your folder structure, it can scrape that folder structure for metadata on each of the assets that it detects, and we also generate checksums for each of those assets, so we know if you have duplicates of those, we don't re-ingest them twice. Uh, essentially what we would do is instead add a format location to an existing asset. You also have the ability to automatically upload those originals to cloud storage so that all of your remote editor teams are able to access that content immediately. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, was appealing about Iconic too was that it, um, the ability it had a strong metadata uh, ability and also that it connects to transcription so we could also transcribe some files and we could add uh, range metadata. So if we wanted to like tag specific moments of the video or use uh, Google's uh, machine learning to Google's um, AI, Google AI. AI, Google's yeah. AI integration to try to tag or categorize specific moments. Um, that was another interesting thing yeah. about uh, how the platform worked as a, as a search system. But I kind of had some questions later about the future of search in Iconic. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to keep kind of going with an overview of uh, how else it can sort of handle the workflow process for uh, remote teams in post-production. Yeah, so you talked a bit about the AI that we integrate with. Um, we use Google AI for image analysis and uh, video analysis. And what that essentially means is we can send our proxy format that we transcode of your content to them. Um, actually, it's the keyframes that we generate from generating that proxy. And it will detect essentially what it sees in that scene uh, and give you time-based metadata on that asset so that your users can click on something that says, hey, uh, you're wearing a black shirt right now, I'm gonna search black shirt, and I can find you in that image or uh, video. On the transcription side, we use Rev AI on the back end. So essentially, we rip the uh, audio out of our proxies, send it off to Rev AI, and then we get back a transcription that is uh, either WebVTT or SRT, and you can download that as text too that becomes indexed in our system and immediately searchable if you choose so. So you can also edit speakers in that transcription and you can edit what's actually said in it. So if there's slang in the actual transcription file, then you can correct that word if the AI didn't really understand what you were saying. A good point you mentioned with the proxy, so everything that gets ingested into Iconic, it automatically gets rendered out as a 
proxy file, right. which you could download to edit, or, but also there's a lot more control over how you have that proxy file rendered than uh, I've seen on some other platforms where you can kind of set, oh, I want this sort of uh, bit rate or this size and how it's created. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, we always generate a uh, web playable proxy and the options that you have are by stock, it's a 720p uh, between four and six megabits per second proxy that allows you to see in the web player what you're looking at. Um, that can also be a 1080p between four and six megabits for, per second. But you also have the ability to generate edit proxies. And what edit proxies are uh, is if you're working in something like 4K and you need one-to-one -one raster size, you can add an additional proxy format to every asset that your editors are using so that when they go into our Premiere panel integration uh, and they request a proxy editing workflow for an asset, they can download that edit proxy instead of using the web label proxy, which may be too compressed for them to work with. And uh, tell me a bit more about the editing workflow. I know there's some uh, integrations with Premiere. Uh, I don't remember which other uh, integrations it might be, but also the so workflow uh, project files and uh, being able to kind of work with proxies and then online it. Sure, so when you, uh, we have uh, Premiere integration. Um, we also work with uh, Photoshop, uh, Audition, um, and a few other Creative Cloud uh, products. We are coming out with an integration for Final Cut Pro, um, and we have future plans for also supporting DaVinci Resolve. Uh, so out of the box today, what most of our users will do is uh, they're editing in Premiere. We have a Premiere panel integration where they can go into uh, a plugin that we have that basically mirrors the exact web UI that you see in your web browser. Uh, an editor can search find their assets, uh, edit metadata, and they can also retrieve the proxy or the original formats of that content. When it comes to uh, cloud storage and on-prem, uh, for on-prem, those editors can actually map that mount of their on-prem storage if they're local to where you are and where the storage is. And we will go and retrieve the asset from that location instead of going up to the cloud and downloading it. In the case of cloud storage, they would have to open the original or open the proxy, download that content. They would edit it. And in our project panel, we essentially keep track of every single asset that we know about. Now let's say you try to drag something from your desktop that Iconic does not yet know about. It'll say to you, uh, hey, I don't know about it, but I'll try to keep track of it for you. And the moment you try to upload that project, it'll bark at you and say, you probably should upload this content so that when a remote editor opens this project later on, they can also relink the high res and proxy for this asset. Mm. Yeah, it's extremely valuable. Every time like you send a project file and it's like, oh, I forgot that one extra file that I added locally and forgot to send you that file, that sound effect. And with cloud storage, uh, I mean, we've talked about because uh, I'm using uh, Google Cloud Storage and Backblaze, but you want to go over a bunch of the other integrations, kind of like bring your own storage. Like, what, el what else do you cover? Sure, so uh, one of the things we're really proud of here at Iconic is that we're storage agnostic. Uh, and what that means is no matter what on-prem storage you're using, we don't care. As long as you can mount it to a machine and see it, we can also see it and ingest from it. In terms of cloud storage, uh, it's pretty much the same thing, anything with S3 protocol. So AWS S3 buckets, uh, Backblaze, uh, Wasabi, Azure as well. So if you have an Azure blob, we can ingest directly from that. Now we scan those on a one hour interval at the very minimum, and you can ingest your content immediately, generate a proxy, whether you want to use your own uh, transcoder to do it locally within the region of the bucket, or if you'd like to use our pool of cloud transcoders, we scale up on demand for all of our customers when they issue an asset to be transcoded uh, via the cloud. You mentioned you can search transcripts, but if you want to search, it'll just tell you if that video clip has, it mentions the word, and then you have to kind of go into the video clip and then see where that phrase was mentioned. Do you see like a future where you kind of can see the actual, like the search results would show the moments, like multiple moments from a certain asset, like if that search term is, is showing up? We're getting there to where uh, you 
might be able to do that in the future. So one of the new uh, releases that we have coming in two weeks actually allows you on the search results to open up the metadata panel. So that's a step in that yeah. direction that you're talking about where you can perform a search, actually click on one of the assets that pop up in the search results, and you can open up the metadata panel in that search view so that you can see, hey, this is exactly where it matches. So you can see if that uh, hit is relevant to you or not. We're not quite there in terms of showing you if you do kind of like a find in page where it highlights. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that'll be a part of our future plans. I mean, we could talk about uh, OpenAI and AI integration in general, but a specific one uh, is they have Whisper for their transcription. Any plans of bringing Whisper in as one of the options for uh, how the transcription runs? Right now for transcription, we're sticking with RevAI. AI. Uh, they, Rev AI actually, there's a Rev AI part and then there's a Rev.com, mm -hmm. which actually does human readable transcriptions. A lot of our clients have a need for that and uh, Rev.com have released an API that we will be working with to implement so that we can have more robust options for our clients to uh, create transcriptions. In terms of Whisper, no plans for that yet, but that's not out of the question. And because we're API first, in terms of uh, using any other solution with Iconic, essentially our API is so robust that it usually depends on the other endpoints API and how robust, robust that is in terms of getting us data for us to make an integration for it. The camera to cloud workflow is kind of a big thing right now. It, what, if you could walk me through like uh, either a process of how like we could get uh, from camera, like the fastest route from camera to Iconic, um, or if there's any plans of like some other, I'm thinking of similar to like Framio has some hardware camera to cloud integration, but uh, anything of like what's sort of the process of getting the quickest like off the camera into Iconic uh, and some form of proxies available for editors to start editing. So we're really focused on uh, acquiring more transcoding support uh, to support raw raw formats. So we already support uh, using the Redline transcoder for red footage. We support a uh, watch folder uh, proxy generator. So essentially the ISG, you can give it a profile that says, hey, if I'm looking for Blackmagic RAW, B-RAW for example, and the ISG sees one of those files, it'll say, I don't know how to transcode this. I'm going to send it to this place where I know there's a watch folder transcoder working to transcode it. It'll send it back to me when it's done, and I can append that proxy to the asset. And we're always trying to find more partners in transcoding so that we can integrate that into Iconic to provide more robust uh, support for raw formats. We actually just came out with a uh, partnership and integration with uh, Heads, Hedge Edit Ready, um, and that'll add a lot of uh, format support for us. Um, and we are working with other partners at the moment, such as um, Highscale, who uh, are trying to build in integrations into Iconic. You can also integrate your own Vantage cluster today with Iconic to send off uh, raw formats for transcoding. Oh, cool, and were there any other updates uh, this year you wanted, we didn't cover yet, or if you wanted to mention the automations that might be coming later this year? Uh, some of the cool things that we are working on that I'm really excited about, for sure at the end of the year, uh, we currently plan on having some kind of integration with DaVinci Resolve. Um, and Resolve is a great NLE, uh, even though it's traditionally a colorist tool. I use it personally for my gaming footage. Um, other integrations that we're working with is, of course, the Final Cut Pro integration is coming out uh, probably in two months. We already are demoing that here at NAB this year. We are also trying to work at the moment on a uh, facial recognition AI framework of our own so that users can train their AI to recognize faces and perchance logos in Iconic in their content. Okay, uh, would that be specific faces and train it? And actually that re reminds me of another question with, uh, if you do get transcriptions done, the speaker labels always reset, so would there any be time of that, of being able to, if you have the same person recurring and across multiple footage, kind of identifying the person? Right now, we haven't considered that, um, but we will try to look at what the facial recognition AI framework looks like, and when that does come out and we have uh, user feedback based on how they're using that, perchance in the future we can use that for tie-in to transcriptions as well.
All right, cool. Well, thanks a lot. A lot of updates. Yeah, Thank you. Right. Thanks for watching the video. For more of our NAB coverage, be sure to check out the playlist right here and hit the subscribe button for more videos like this. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.